Unfortunately, the Bible doesn't solve the perpetual cats versus dogs debate. Famously, cats are never mentioned in the Bible. And although, although dogs are often mentioned in Holy Scripture, they are usually mentioned negatively. Now, my last name is Cowherd. If I had a nickel for every time someone asked me, do you think your ancestors ever herded cows? I would be very, very rich. But I actually don't know much about animals, and sometimes even my affection for them can be lacking. Today is Good Shepherd Sunday. It is every year on the fourth Sunday of Easter. And history is more my wheelhouse, so maybe I could share some tidbits from our past rather than show how little I know about animals. I was indeed able to find a nugget from Good Shepherd's history that actually does involve animals. There are frequent references in Vestry Minutes, and if I had conversation with some of our more venerable members that confirm this, about animals at Good Shepherd, or rather animals inside Good Shepherd. Mice, wasps, snakes even, are featured often in accounts from the old church, appearing mid-service on the floor or in the rafters, at which point they would have to be shunted out by watchful ushers. Later today, we will reverse that pattern after our 1015 service in the grove, going outside, inviting animals in. On Good Shepherd Sunday, we celebrate the 140 plus years of this parish with sheep and shepherd as the focus for the day. An amen to that. There were a lot of metaphors that Jesus used to help explain who he was to us. Christ the King, Holy Comforter, Bread of Life, the Advocate. But the most famous of these is Good Shepherd. Our predecessors liked it so much they decided to name the church after it. So here we are. These metaphors from Psalm 23, from our gospel, from our hymns, all become real in front of our eyes, especially if you come to the service, come to the uh, event after the service at 1015. They also serve a purpose. They remind us just how smelly and dirty that we really are. That's really more of a bit of an Ash Wednesday message, maybe. It doesn't strike the celebratory tone of Good Shepherd Sunday. But think about it from the first century, from Jesus' time. They probably had less illusions about sheep and their innate cuddliness or their intrinsic value. Sheep were a powerful symbol, not because they were cute, or their goodness, but because of their limitations. This might mean some forgetting of what we learned in Sunday school of Jesus surrounded by animals like St. Francis or Dr. Doolittle. Jesus might have indeed loved animals, but I think his larger point was a different one. It was the same point that he made elsewhere when he was talking about children. Children were to be loved because they were vulnerable, too. They can't fend for themselves. They need direction and care and guidance, just like sheep. Jesus had not read 20th century parenting books or heard podcasts from the 21st. So his message was actually not that children and animals had value because they were better, somehow free, from the sins of society. They had value because they were vulnerable. 
That's what gave them special value in his reckoning. So that's one thing, but then the idea gets tougher because Jesus keeps calling the disciples children, keeps calling them sheep. That means we are the sheep. Sheep really took it on the chin during the pandemic. Do you recall this? Not sheep as animals, but sheep as concept. There's all sorts of references to people who followed medical advice as being sheep-like in their mindless obedience. I don't think there's much to say about that, other than there is to say there's nothing more deeply rooted in the Anglican, the Episcopal tradition than to use the gifts that God has given you from society, including science and the wisdom of the community. Regardless, our job as sheep during the pandemic and before the pandemic and after the pandemic is to keep listening for the voice of the Good Shepherd, remembering what it sounds like, distinguishing it from other voices. Otherwise, our job as sheep is simply to laze around in the fields and eat grass all day. Really? <laughs> How do we get to do that? One commentator writes it this way. Sheep live in leisure because they have a future defined by hope, protected and nurtured by the shepherd. They can enjoy today because there is a tomorrow. They can live in the moment because they know that moment is not the last. What a word of good news, of gospel hope that we need now and always. But we don't actually want to be the sheep. At least me, I want to be the good shepherd. The reminder from our gospel story is that job is already taken. Jesus doesn't need, furthermore, a vice shepherd or an assistant to the regional manager shepherd. The church always tries to get back to that image of the good shepherd, even as it falls in love with other ones. During medieval times, it was Christ the King. During the Enlightenment, it was Jesus as philosopher teacher. In the last century, it's my favorite, it was best friend Jesus, cool Jesus. But around the time that Good Shepherd was founded, there was a whole movement in Christianity about going back outdoors, getting closer to the earth, reminding ourselves of our connection to creation and our closeness to animals. That movement was responding, here's more historical tidbits, to urbanization and industrialization and included the founding of the YMCA, the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, think Teddy Roosevelt, even the Boy Scouts and the Olympics were a part of this larger movement. Closer to home, Shrinemont, the Diocese of, Virginia's, Diocese of Virginia's Camps and Conference Center was founded, in part in order to get people outside, communing with nature and with animals. There was a particular concern that clergy living in Northern Virginia and in Richmond were getting a little soft and needed to be outdoors more. That was more than 100 years ago. So it's safe to say the church always needed to be reminded about Christ, the Good Shepherd. Maybe that's why we got named what we did. Luckily, the call of the Good Shepherd is a powerful one. It's comforting, like a nudge to a wayward lamb. It's also fierce in protecting us from wolves and other danger. We've all heard that call in some way. 
That's why we're a part of this community. Nothing makes me happier than to hear stories about how people found their way, heard that call, how parishioners chose Good Shepherd as their parish church. My story of that is simple. I interviewed with Christine three plus years ago, and at some point she said, Charles, there is resurrection going on in this place. I know it because I've experienced it in my own life. It's happening here too. You've seen it in your life. Resurrection is happening at the Church of the Good Shepherd. Those were powerful words for my future boss. Three years later, I'm still here. I share that, and you could say, that's a good narrative of decision-making. She said it. You heard it. She chose me to come. I chose to do likewise. But here is actually what Jesus said about that dynamic, about his voice and his call. He said, you did not choose me. I chose you. We're not here because we chose to, but because someone else chose us. Here's a sampling of how some of you described how you got here, how you chose to be here. This one happens a lot. People say, we showed up one day and we never left. People say, our neighbor said we should try it, and now couldn't live without it. This one touched me. Someone said, we were on our way to leaving, going to another church. Something pulled us back in. My favorite is this. We joined because of the discount at the preschool, and now I'm on the vestry. What do you call that sort of choosing, that sort of behavior? You can call it the Holy Spirit moving the hearts and minds and bodies into this church. Or you could call it a bunch of sheep, hearing the voice of the Good Shepherd, becoming the church of the Good Shepherd. Amen.